Welcome from Las Vegas, Nevada, the host city of NAB 2014. We're here on the 45th floor of the Trump International Hotel. This is Cinema 5D on the couch. Presented by b and the professional's source. Vitech Videocom, Tools on Air, and Zeiss. So welcome back. That's the second part of the fourth episode of On the Couch. Now, now we're here with Canon and Sony, competitors sitting on the same couch. That's Peter Yapsley from Canon Europe and um, Fabienne Pisano, now I have it, from Sony Europe. Welcome. Um, let's talk about your new products. What's new from Canon? Uh, well, we've got three main things on the booth uh, this time. In terms of cameras, we've taken a step back to the more traditional camcorder line and we've introduced two new products, the XF200 and 205. So they're going to sit between the existing XF100 series and the 300 series. Those, those products will carry on, um, but we've got the 205 and the 200 in the middle, and the same as our other lineups, those two cameras are just distinguished by the fact the 205 has uh, timecode genlock and SDI output, so for multi-camera or small studio, um, you've got the choice there. The 200 is exactly the same camera. And the concept of those is really to try and marry all of the best features that we've introduced in our cameras over the past couple of years into a really, really compact and mobile, versatile body that's really easy to use, lightweight. So it's a very small camera, but operationally it's completely designed from scratch. Um, it's really, really nice to use. There's a whole host of, of useful features in there. So um, what's new compared to the XF100 and 105? So we have a 20 times zoom lens now um, in the 205. Um, still uh, a third inch sensor, but it's a newer version, so it's more sensitive, better dynamic range, really good dynamic range for a small camera, actually. Um, we've got the Digic 4 processor, of course, and then in terms of recording, we've got the uh, MXF 50 megabit 422 codec, so broadcast quality codec onto CF card, but also it's got SD card recording um, in MP4 uh, in 1080p, and you can shoot at 35 megabits in MP4, so you're actually getting better quality than even uh, normal AVCHD. Um, but you can also shoot in, uh, in a lower resolution to the card, to the SD card, while you're shooting HD to CF. So you've got that option of capturing both at the same time if you need a quick turnaround from those small files. Um, as I say, the design is completely new. So we've got a three ring uh, lens control. We've got a rotating hand grip, it's very comfortable to use. We've got an OLED screen rather than an LCD and a much improved viewfinder, um, much larger and higher resolution. So it's really easier to use. Um, and then we've also got built-in Wi-Fi and Ethernet in there as well um, for FTP transfer or for so remote uploading control. stuff to Facebook from the camera. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, oh, is it for controlling? Yeah. Features? So, so it's uh, Wi-Fi remote control yeah. from from a web browser, but also for FTP file mm -hmm. transfer as well. Um, and there will be actually a, a proxy streaming mode, um, a very low bit rate um, when you immediately need to save to another device. Um, so it's really a, a whole combination of all sorts of different factors. You know, it's got a new image stabilizer system. It's got our existing instant AF system, even four channel audio now, because that was some of the feedback we heard. So the whole thing was really about recognizing that we've, uh, we've launched a lot of exciting products in the Cinema EOS line over the past couple of years, but there's a whole host of people that still, you know, just need practical mm. video tools to so shoot still on. So taking the small camera seriously, basically. Exactly. It's really trying to provide the best small camera that we've made so far, um, especially for people who, are, who aren't expert shooters. There's still a lot of people capturing video out there now that aren't necessarily trained as a cameraman, uh, camera operator, and sometimes those people need a bit of help, and that kind of camera is great, you know, great for them as well as for the experts. Mm. But then in the, in the cinema side, on the cinema EOS side, we've, we've taken again a bit of a departure and we've introduced our first uh, Cine Servo zoom lens. So this is a 4K lens designed for large sensor cameras, but completely redesigned from the ground up to be operated like a broadcast lens, a, a, an ENG lens effectively. Um, so it's smaller than the uh, inform factor than the existing lenses with a servo drive unit on the side, so it can be operated on the shoulder but it also means you can operate it in a studio environment with zoom and focus demands. And I think it's 17 to 120 millimeters. Exactly, that's right. So seven times zoom, um, it's lightweight, it's, it's a really nice piece of glass, fantastic op optical quality, and of course it's matched with our existing cine lenses. So, so it covers Super 35 or full exactly. frame? Exactly, yep, Super, super 35. 35. Um, uh, and you can actually uh, detach the drive unit as well. So if you want to shoot in a more sort of cinematic production, um, then you have the option to put follow focus and other accessories on it. Then you can just 
put the drive unit back on, pick it up, and, and off you go. Um, so that's, uh, that's a really exciting, exciting step for us. And again, that's really come from what we're hearing from, from customers, from broadcasters, from It is filmmakers. true. I mean, I shoot a lot of documentaries, and I think this, that's exactly the, the kind of focal length you need for documentary because you don't want to change, often you don't have the time to change the lens. So, so far, I mean, I looked a lot at, you know, Engineer, we're one of the few manufacturers, lens manufacturers that had lenses which are kind of in that, you know, field. Uh, but this one uh, sounds quite exciting, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing, uh, also maybe in the context of this conversation, is that uh, we have two versions of the lens. So we've got EF and PL. And of course, you know, EF is supporting all of the, the Canon cameras and lots of people are using EF mount. But the PL version is the first to have the Cook Eye Technology interface. So you can actually power the lens and get lens metadata from some other cameras. So it's really intended as a tool for the industry. It's part of Canon Cinema EOS lineup, but uh, we're hearing so much demand for these kind of cameras, broadcasters and filmmakers are moving to, to large sensor. Mm. The idea is to, to give them an option from Canon. But uh, don't, don't you find it ironic that this lens maybe work better on an F5, F55 than on the Canon camera because of the power issue? Because you, you can't power the lens from the battery uh, I mean, of, a F, of a C300, but you can power it of a D-tab from a, from a F5, F55. To be honest, we, we, no, we don't find it ironic <laughs> at all because we, we're just trying to offer a, offer a tool to the maximum number yeah. of people. And obviously we've developed this after we introduced the Cinemarios line and those cameras are fantastic and they have the capability that they have. And you can swap the mounts, right? You um, can a trained service facility can do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, a trivial job. It's not an end user job. Yeah, but it um, is possible. It is possible, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, really, that's a really exciting thing for us. And it's very much, there's a big story about lens on our stand this year and about Canon's uh, heritage as a lens manufacturer and, and um, you know, maybe refocusing a little bit more on, on glass because uh, we all like to talk so much about cameras, which True. are, of course, very important. Yeah. But for us, it's, uh, it's all about glass as well. True. I mean, in the, the show we had earlier, we recorded earlier today with Zeiss, that was exactly the issue because people talk so much about cameras, especially on this show. And um, the weird thing is people forget that the glass is even more important. When, when somebody asks me what to buy, you know, when I have like a thousand euros, what should I spend it on if I want a new camera and, uh, and some glass? Never buy the, the more expensive camera with a kit lens, rather buy a cheaper camera with a better lens because it will stay for, with you much longer. Um, what about uh, Sony? What, what's new from Sony? All right, so there's a lot of new stuff at NAB. Uh, I guess that the one that I would select for the, the scope of the conversation now uh, will be, first of all, uh, um, a new Handycam coder in the XDCam lineup. So this is the, the, the file-based uh, 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 family of, of camcorder in Sony. The name is PXWX180. Uh, it's a handy camcorder with two slots for S by S Pro Plus, which is our new uh, uh, high bandwidth uh, memory uh, uh, recording device. Uh, it's a 25 uh, times zoom lens uh, uh, camera with uh, three third inch sensors. And uh, as the rest of the, the, the industry, we see the evolution towards the necessity of having networked wireless camera. And of course, this one get the Wi-Fi connection, uh, Wi-Fi connection for file transfer, Wi-Fi connection for uh, uh, camera piloting. So getting an app, looking into the camera, what are my clips, sorting them out, logging metadata, all this kind of new, new uh, behavior uh, that is happening in the market. Uh, nice new tools like uh, the possibility of the NFC connection, you know, uh, um, taking a smartphone, just typing it into the, the camera and uh, uh, connecting them like that without any other parameter to enter. So yes, it's, it, it's this one that is complementing the, this, uh, this application. We see it used by uh, 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 videographers, like interviews like we do today, but also it's more and more used into the broadcasters where we sell also our high-end shoulder style two third inch camera and more and more uh, we see a, a clear balance towards 50-50 usage between the uh, classical shoulder mount ENG operation style and the handheld. So it's complementing this family. So this is the first one. Also you probably heard also about the um, uh, mirrorless Alpha 7 now moving to the S version with 4K recording. So this is what uh, there's a lot of people. There are far more people on the booth 
queuing up to these parts that I, I would have thought for a high level show like uh, like NAB. I'm surprised, and um, so it's generating a lot of interest. Also by the the, the key rental house that usually buy some. 20k, 40k package for cameras, but they are really considering it as a additional tool, crash cam, not even B cam, crash cam for some 4k shooting. So this one is interesting. And the last part, which is uh, closer to my heart because it's my direct line for Europe, is the cinematography F series, which are now uh, benefiting from a, a full brush up at NAB. Uh, the, the strategy in Sony is, is to try to limit as possible the launch of, uh, of new products, even if the market is super demanding. There was a huge, huge demand since one year of the F-Series were launched for uh, a dedicated shoulder style, uh, big sensor documentary uh, uh, camera. And we, we resisted to, to, to this. And uh, more than launching a new camera, we launched an adapter uh, uh, um, um, that will er, that will host the F5 or the F55. So it's a it's a shoulder adapter that will be an accessory, and this accessory will bring you everything that you you want or you used to have on a DigiBeta camera, typically or a TV cam camera. That means wireless audio. That means shoulder part that you can move uh, forward and backwards to balance the, the the zoom lens. That means all the classical controls of white balance, gain, starting the camera, uh, uh, changing the audio level, everything you need to be alone on a shoot with a camera on your shoulder. But then it's a big sensor 4K camera. So the, you also announced that the F5 is now upgradable to an F55? Oh yes. So How this does was that work? Uh, is, it yeah. only, is it a hardware upgrade? Or? Yes, it's a hardware upgrade. The, um, the major difference between the F5 and the F55 lies into the sensor. Uh, the F55 having this super uh, wide gamut uh, uh, global shutter sensor that will avoid all the you know all the rolling shutter issues and all, all this. Um, so this came came clear that a lot of people made the choice initially of the F5 for cost reason. Now looking forward to get this feature of the global shutter plus internal 4K recording with XAVC. You know, without having this external raw recorder to get a full 4K workflow. So uh, instead of them putting that on the grain market and getting back an F55, we're now uh, allowing this, uh, this camera to get back to us in our labs and be changed on the sensor side and also internal boards. So this will be uh, the, the cost of this, of course, we're going to calculate so it match uh, as best as we can the price of an F55. Mm -hmm. That means that will be transparent for any F5 user so you will to upgrade probably to end F55. Up not, not paying so much more if you did. If you well, I think I think the price gap is something like 10k, and um, yeah. So for the upgrade, when you have the upgraded F5, yeah, you will end up it having be, paid almost yeah, the same as it the should F5 be the same cost on an F55. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, the, the 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 last one that is worth mentioning yet, uh, as well, is the um, is the ability. Uh, by IBC timing to also have an hardware upgrade that will be chargeable <laughs> as well uh, to uh, extend the codec portfolio to Apple ProRes and Avid DNX. And this is meant to streamline the ingest and the process both into some production house that have typically some Final Cut Pro and servers or broadcasters that own their own F555 fleet and usually are very widely used Avid system. So that will be a hardware upgrade as well? Oh, yes. And I is it 4K ProRes? So all the flavors, all the resolutions? No, it's uh, HD fl is the ProRes for 2K. Okay. For 4K, we are really committing to our XAVC format that is now quite widely interoperable into the, the main NLE and, uh, and the server manufacturer. So we're really capitalizing on this XAVC uh, uh, codec, which is, by the way, very open codec. You can play it in, uh, in VLC. Mm. You also mentioned the A7S and that you were surprised by the response that it had. Well, I'm surprised here at NAB, which is National Association Broadcaster Show. Uh, yeah, the, the crowd around this, and uh, it's not only videographers and cinematographers, really people to, uh, seeing yeah. it into the a full chain. Basically, it's fitting into a chain, and uh, even myself, I was not 
I was not anticipating that. I have to say I'm not surprised at all because people yeah. want small cameras and I think yeah. Canon has been very strong on that part with the C300, C500, 1DC mm -hmm. and that's where Sony from my point of view needs to catch up because mm -hmm. still I love the F5, F55 and all the features they have mm, it's but not the, same the anymore. form factor <laughs> The form factor is like more the traditional box-shaped form factor that we have come used to for ages. Of course. When when cameras were still eating tape, you know, like uh, <laughs> there is a there is a big market I think for small cameras, and mm. there is a, a lot of uses for them. Mm. Um, in small rooms, mm. in in special environments, you are just mm. faster with small of cameras. Of course, you're aware you can't do exactly the same thing eh? in terms of uh, dynamic range, in terms of uh, recording format. It would record 4K, but in long long up won't be able to sustain the 600 megabits per second of what an S-Base Pro Plus yeah. can do, but of course. So the Sony A7S is quite exciting, very small 4K camera with a um, very good codec. If you, you have to record externally, but the XAVC-S is very, very good. Uh, is there anything from Canon where we can, you know, we, we've been waiting for, for a small mirrorless Canon camera with a quality that can match the, the DSLR range uh, for a while now. Is there anything on the horizon or nothing you can talk about? <laughs> well, naturally, nothing I could talk about. <laughs> but, I mean, no, what, what I would say is um, in, in the video arena particularly, you know, we've been quite focused on um, introducing the Cinemaria series and expanding it, um, especially from the lens point of view. So <clears throat> we were only just over two years into the, the cinema business, if you like, or the large sensor business. We've got four cameras, we've got 11 lenses. Um, <clears throat> there's really a lot you can do with those and that's, you know, that's taken a lot of our focus. Um, and we've also introduced some traditional camcorders in that time. So, you know, naturally there's a, a sort of uh, a limit to, to what we can do and how quick we can do it. But we're, we're always looking to see what the, what the next step is and, and listening to what people are, are saying at these shows and what, what kind of products they want to use. And I think you know what we what we've done with Cinema EOS, for example, shows that in the development from the 5D particularly, um, and we'll we'll keep doing that. The the CN 7x17 times is another perfect example. Um, so we'll we'll keep going. Um, I mean the other, uh, let's say, thing that we've introduced that did also come from uh, in part from user feedback really is this idea of autofocus, um, which we were talking a little bit about earlier on. So. Um, <clears throat> It's well known that, especially for, for less experienced users, um, focus is a, is a very difficult uh, issue with large sensor cameras. Um, and with the new dual pixel CMOS uh, AF technology that we have, um, we've been able to get around that issue somewhat and give the users a, a, a bit more help. So in the EOS 70D that we uh, launched fairly recently, the DSLR camera, um, we introduced this technology for the first time. Um, but we have actually implemented it in the sensors in the C100 and the C300. Um, it's just at the time those cameras were launched, actually the system wasn't fully developed and it wasn't ready to go. But uh, we're now able to offer um, the, uh, a feature upgrade to the C100 uh, to get the dual pixel CMOS AF activated. And that means you can have autofocus with any Canon EF lens um, with electrical operation. So that's more than 100 lenses and that's all kinds of interesting stuff, you know, all the way from, from the fish eyes to the big zooms. Um, that's coming to the C300. Um, a little bit later this year, I think hopefully next month. Um, and that is a, that's a service upgrade, so you have to take it into a Canon service center or send it back to Canon. There's some calibration and some updates that need to be done for that, but it makes shooting with those cameras fantastically easy. Um, it's not perfect. It's not autofocus as people would know it in, for example, an XF305. It does still need a bit of thought and a bit of work, but it's extremely effective, and the technology to be able to do that in a large sensor camera is uh, is really impressive, which I think it's going to um, be really useful for a lot of people. It is nice that, I mean, in general, the autofocus from us professionals, we never liked it because we are used to it not working properly. It's you know, this typical that you think that you know from older, you know, mostly, yeah, like uh, CCD cameras where they keep looking for the focus point and just don't find it. And I think it's, it's, it's the new, uh, I, I tried the one on the C100 and it works quite well. I mean, of course, as you said, it has some issues, but I think mo many of them stem from the lenses because the lenses are made for stills. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there, there were always technical limitations in the past um, and some of those have been overcome. Um, but really it's another option. 
you know, depending on how you're shooting, you were just talking about small cameras, big cameras, it's not going to be for everyone, but with a camera, particularly like the C100, uh, we designed that to be um, a single shooter's camera as far as we could, uh, or for small crews. Um, so adding that kind of feature is going to help those users. And to be honest, when we announced it, so many people were excited and interested that, you know, it, uh, they, there was just great demand to have it in the C300 as well which surprised us a bit because we were expecting more of this kind of uh, sort of traditional cinematographer's feedback of, I hate auto, I want everything manual. But actually, um, yeah, there's been a, a, a very positive response to the idea of putting it in there. Well, you know, the, you know the hype about handheld stabilizers, like the Movi and all the copycats and all this. And on these things, it's very useful to have. That's where I used it uh, on the 70D and the, and the C100 on the Movi because you don't need remote follow focus is an extremely expensive device of course it has its uses and it if you need critical focus you still need to use one but if it's just you know documentary style shooting with one of these gimbals uh, it helps you if there is proper autofocus and that's you still want to be able to have large sensors and, and so far the two didn't go together this is quite a, an interesting topic i think as well though because um there's maybe a question as whether you do need the large sensor on those devices if you're not going to go for a very shallow depth of field. Um, because actually these kind of small, let's say more traditional camcorders, which have a lot more automatic functions and that are easier to control, especially with the Wi-Fi remote control these days, um, are a good option. Uh, not for all circumstances, but I think are sometimes uh, not always considered by people these days. The kind of default is to go for that large sensor. I agree to a degree, but there are two things that are problems. First of all, the light sensitivity. Very often, you know, you, with the small cameras, you're just limited in, in of course, what kind yeah, of light you can Depending on the situation, yeah. And the second one is simply these gimbals like the Movi can only tang cam take cameras that are about this long. And many of the smaller cameras are very long because they have a built-in lens. So, and it gets much and more, more difficult to, to actually be able to balance them on the rig. Yeah, I mean, of course, it depends on the device. But I think also we're seeing so much stuff shot on... Uh, uh, on copters these days as well um, and in those situations um, obviously there are more challenges with the large sensor it's a bit tougher to shoot in some situations and uh, you know it, it's it's good I think that there's still uh, all those choices out there for people to consider and, and that kind of thing is also somewhere where the the 205 um, is a good option because you've got the Wi-Fi control you've got SDI output so you can record you know on a high bit rate if you want as well um, with the big zoom, with all the auto functions as well. So just kind of having that palette of things for people to consider and trying to make it as easy as we can with the technology that's there. Mm -hmm. So you both, I don't know how long you've been working in this industry, I, I guess for a while. Uh, you've, we've seen it develop immensely over the past 10, 15 years and, 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 and it just turned upside down. And there's a lot of new market for video that hasn't been there before. Uh, with regards to the, the products that you have, where do you see what are the major trends that you can make out with regards to what kind of stuff people shoot? Is it changing? Or um, need, do cameras need to be more versatile? And uh, what has changed compared to, let's say, 10, 15 years ago? Right, so I've been, yeah. A big question. No, no, <laughs> big uh, answer, it makes, <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think you, you, you already, uh, there's a big part of the answer in your question already, but, uh, uh, I've, I've been in, in this business for 13 years myself, okay? and uh, um, what, I, what I reckon as the, as the major move uh, will be the fact that the, some, some segmentation, sorry it's a, it's a bit technical marketing world, but it's really like that, some, some markets of the, the, the production that were apart, like Cinematography was really a part, and uh, I remember 10 years ago, 35 millimeter was nowhere near to be attacked by anything because it was uh, really the holy grail and still is in some case, uh, but was really separated fr from the rest. was really a big gap between cinema application and, and TV uh, with very different tools. Uh, the same, you had all the corporate video shooting like what we are doing today, and then broadcasters shooting news gathering with quite different tools, okay? And, and really there was also a big gap here in terms of quality, sensitivity, stability, everything you wanted. What I reckon is going, it has happened over these 10 years and accelerating is the fact that cinema industry, news gathering, mainstream TV production, corporate videos, you see them 
merging, and you see some, some tools in uh, in Canon, in Sony, in all our, in all the key manufacturers that are now so versatile in terms of technicity, in terms of pricing, in terms of ergonomy, in terms of worldwide knowledge that you are bringing, for example, with your website or or sharing the knowledge. That oh my God, there there, there is there is some tools that you could use for. I exaggerate it, not all the application, but you start to see some, some cameras that you would almost use for, for any different market. This is a clear trend that, 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 that has been very visible. It's really concentration of the technology that could then, with some tools, apply to so many different usage. And I think the extension of that um, is maybe the thing we've seen particularly from our point of view since the 5D Mark II is um, the availability of those all those tools is letting more people shoot. So it's not necessarily, I think, the case that people are shooting different things because of the digital tools. Of course, the tools are better now, but those cameras and lenses that are out there suddenly became more accessible, more available, so more people could shoot the kind of content they wanted to. Where, you know, if you gave them enough film and a crew for free, whether they would have shot different content, I'm not sure, actually. It's just they were able to do it, whereas before they, they, they didn't have the option. Yeah, and I think it democratizes filmmaking. I mean, you see so much talent now, if you just go on Vimeo or Google uh, or, or YouTube, where people with really hardly any means produce something amazing that a lot yeah, of people the, who... The, the barrier before, the, the, the barrier to really, to really edited, yeah. do something quality, working on child depth of field, working on resolution that could be displayed on big screen. I remember when I started, it was really, there was a threshold and you before you could be in, it was a long way. And it's true that today it's much, much democratized. That said, are we seeing much better stuff? Maybe better and different are two, <laughs> two different questions. <laughs> well, we're, we're seeing much more, for yeah. sure. We are oh, also, for sure, the, we are the content is yeah. exploding. I mean, the content is exploding worldwide. Uh, you look at the look at the newspapers. Uh, 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 all of them now having a, a website with some video additional. So for sure, this is also evolving. The the content is really exploding. So, where's this all headed? Do you have any idea where where do you think well, what are what are people demanding the most? The crystal ball question. Well, I think, well. <laughs> but I think it, I think it relates to what we've already discussed. And you, you look at what uh, what Canon have been doing and what other companies been doing. Um, and there has been this desire for more developed and sophisticated digital, large sensor digital cameras and the lenses to go with them. So I think you know we're going to see more and more people still wanting to shoot with large sensors, right or wrong, whatever for the circumstances. Um, so there'll be just some development there, and that's continuing to happen from from many companies. Um, uh, and we see that especially in, in broadcast as well. Um, you know, the kinds of camera that, that we brought into the market with Cinema EOS, we weren't necessarily thinking TV business at, at the outset, um, but actually those kind of cameras are, are really widespread now. Um, and that's going to maybe happen more and more. But also then there's a question that's coming up more and more is what is the right kind of glass in those environments and those situations. Um, with the best will in the world, you know, Canon ZF lenses, they're fantastic quality, but they're not the easiest thing to shoot video on. Um, so there's, I think there's a, there's a conversation about where the cameras go and a conversation about where the lenses go, and obviously they're, they're tied together, but... Um, I agree, I mean, it's funny you call them cinema EOS, but you see the, the I'm a C300 owner, I shoot a lot on the F5, F55 as well. Uh, for documentaries, but for other documents, I used to see three, my own C300, and I very often get called up from TV channels because they specifically ask me, they know that I shoot with larger sensor cameras, but I, I shoot for traditional TV channels, they have their own cameraman, but for the larger sensor stuff, they come to me because they, they, they want it, but for all kinds of stuff, even sometimes news, but mostly documentaries, it's everywhere now, and especially the C300, the F3, the F5, uh, they are everywhere now in, in, in TV and uh, it, it's, it's really caught on. So I think the, what you're addressing with the, with the zoom rocker lens, the 17-120, what I think only Fujinon had, the, had a lens before like that. Sony has a lens that for the F5, F55, but it's relatively slow. I don't know the name, but it's like a huge range. 
Yeah, no, it's it's the we don't have the the, the zoom rocker uh, style. Uh, there is a ver the there is a Sony lens. It, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't recall it, it, the name. It was the former one that was yeah. with the with the F3 series uh, uh, some years yeah. ago. I mean but where, what we provide is the is the PL mount uh, six package of, mm -hmm. of prime lenses. Yeah, I mean, there's a big big market for these kind of lenses for these type of cameras, and I think. You're right, I mean, it's all growing together and the differentiation between cinema and TV is blurring slowly. Wow. Okay, I think that the place where it's still very valid and very visible is the lens in the lens domain. Uh, the, the remark I was making it was much more on the, yeah. the camera itself. Truly the lens, what made a cinema lens is, is still very particular yet. It's true because the budgets are, are not yeah, there in, in TV. Yeah. But I mean, technically, yeah it's growing together uh, yeah, okay. because all mm. on big sensors. Mm. But I mean, I think the thing as well is, especially coming from a European perspective, is, you know, uh, there are different stages of development in the market in different parts of the world. And not everybody is at 4K raw yet. You know, not everybody is talking about delivering content in Ultra HD. Some people are still thinking HD is the next or step. Or 720p. <laughs> exactly, so, you know, I think uh, it's certainly something that we're aware of. So of course we, we try and keep bringing you know, new products which are uh, at the forefront and, and driving things along. But at the same time, like the XF205, there's still this big pool of people who are, who are just, um, let's say, not at the front of the curve. Um, there's, they're still using the tools that have, have been around a while. Um, and so we need to cater to them as well, um, which we'll continue to do, of course. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time. I think we have to wrap it up. Um, All right. We'll see each other on the show floor and we're looking forward for new exciting products from Canon and Sony. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. That was episode four of On the Couch. Um, thanks to all our sponsors. Uh, first and foremost, B&H, who supplied all the equipment we use here. Um, Vitek Videocom, Zeiss and Tools on Air. Thank you and see you in episode five.